Hey everybody, I'm Adam, and this is Think Club. Okay, I feel obligated to start this video with a spoiler alert. I'm going to be talking about the movie Inglorious Bastards, which is a great movie. I am only going to be talking about the opening scene, but I am going to spoil it for you. So if you want to see Inglorious Bastards, run out and pause this video and run out and go watch it and then come back to this video. Next, I want to give a trigger warning, which is really a little bit tongue in cheek, but a little bit serious because I know people get very particular when you talk about morality. And I'm going to talk about morality here in a very mechanistic way. This is something that is an idea I've been kicking around. You do not have to believe it. You're under no obligation to believe it. I'm putting it out there as an idea for us to converse about because I think it's interesting. It is in line with a lot of what Jordan Peterson is talking about, about morality is about responsibility, that finding meaning in our lives or responsibility is something that we do as humans. And I want to relate that to the evolutionary process that I think demystifies a lot of these conversations, a lot of these debates that people are having about morality. So I'm going to start off with a very short clip here of Jordan Peterson talking to Jonathan Sachs about finding meaning in life through responsibility to sort of set the stage for this greater argument that I I want to make. How come this is speaking to young people today when we live in perhaps the freest, most uh, individualistic age that we've had in the West in all of history? There's two issues. One is the problem of totalitarianism. The other is the problem of nihilism. And nihilism is predicated on the observation that well, that there are time frames, let's say, that you can apply to your being that seem to reduce it to to meaninglessness. What difference is it going to make in a million years what I do? And there's an underground uh, desirability about nihilism too, which is, which is a more pernicious one, which is, well, my life is meaningless and that's terrible, but it also means I have no responsibility. And so that's the secret attraction of nihilism. And I think that many, many young people are trapped by their own rationality into either a totalitarian viewpoint, which is often encouraged by the universities, not least, or a nihilistic viewpoint. And those aren't the only two viewpoints. Like the viewpoint that the human being has a nobility of spirit and is an adventurer on the high seas of the unknown and that is required to bear a tremendous amount of responsibility. That's a very credible story. So I have a little bit more setup to do before we jump into the actual argument here. The original inspiration for this video was a Richard Carrier debate where he is debating a Christian and they are talking about morality. And I feel like they're talking past one another quite a bit. And I conceptualize morality in this very unique and evolutionarily thinking way that I kind of cobbled together from the ideas of Jordan Peterson and the ideas of Jonathan Haidt. And for me, it seems to make a lot of sense. And what I'm doing is, I'm not saying this is the way that it is factually at the moment, but I am looking at these debates through this lens and I am evaluating what people are saying as if this could be the case and asking myself, well, does what they're saying fit in? into this paradigm, this metaphor that I have conceptualized. So I want to put it out there because I figure you guys might think, hey, this is an interesting way to look at morality, and maybe I'll look at these debates this way, and maybe we can move the conversation forward about morality, where a lot of these debates just seem to be kind of mired in the, I think morality is this way, you think morality is that way, and never the two ideas should meet. <laughs> So I was watching this debate between Richard Carrier and S.J. Thomason, where Richard Carrier admits to being a hedonist, and he is trying to establish a moral framework based on well-being or pleasure, the typical atheist or anti-theist conception of morality. And there's another aspect to it as well, of course, as a hedonist, compassion is a really important source of pleasure. Uh, and I think that people who don't realize that are cutting out a huge part of opportunities for their life. And they're actually cutting out, they have a big hole in terms of 
the sort of pleasures and satisfactions they could have in their life. So if you're actually to compare the options, the two lives they live, one with compassion and the one without, one of those lives is going to be more satisfying than the other, and it's going to be the one that has more compassion in it. So Richard Carrier's morality is all about the individual. It's about maximizing well-being as something that the individual should strive for. And your moral framework should be all about making your life the best possible life that it can be. And he actually goes as far as saying that compassion, which is an integral part of morality in his eyes, is something that we derive a lot of pleasure from. This is a very pleasurable activity, being compassionate. It. And immediately I thought, well, that just sounds like BS <laughs> because where where I come from, uh, the morality I was raised with, it's compassion is not a lot of pleasure. Compassion is doing the right thing when it's very, very difficult to do. You don't derive a lot of pleasure from it. You derive a lot of meaning from it. And this goes back to what Jordan Peterson is talking about, about getting meaning in your life through responsibility. And responsibility can also be conceptualized as suffering. <laughs> like Responsibility is not always fun. So immediately I thought when Richard Carrier said this, I thought this is BS. And I thought of the movie Inglorious Bastards. And if you've seen the movie Inglorious Bastards, you know, the first scene is pretty amazing. It takes place in France in 1941 with a dairy farmer working on his farm. His three beautiful daughters are tending to the laundry and suddenly a Nazi officer known as the Jew Hunter shows up with several armed guards and wants to talk to him. Now, this is a very uncomfortable situation since you know that this guy has absolutely no power whatsoever. But it becomes even more uncomfortable when you realize that he is hiding a Jewish family beneath his floorboards in his home. Now, this is something I would describe as a very compassion act. This is something that is compassion turned up to an 11. Now, look at this guy's face. Does this look like a man who is in ecstasy? Does this look like a man who is experiencing a great deal of pleasure as he talks to this Nazi officer who is looking for the Jewish family that is hiding beneath his feet? Now, we can have a discussion about morality and what is the correct thing to do in this situation, but we know what the correct thing to do in this situation is if you don't want to die. The Nazi officer actually offers the farmer an out. He says, if there is anyone hiding here and you tell me about them hiding here and I don't have to do a search, then you can go free. You and your family are off the hook. Now, does he do that? Does he turn the Jewish family in? Is he just in this for this level of ecstasy that he is receiving in this situation? Somehow, I don't think compassion is about pleasure. I think compassion is about meaning through responsibility, through suffering, through sticking together, through doing right by people when it is extremely difficult. Morality isn't about creating a world that is pleasurable for all of us to live in. The world is a very harsh place, and you have a much better advantage of surviving in that harsh world if you are embedded in a team that is going to take responsibility for you, and you are going to take responsibility for them. And that is exactly what the farmer does. He doesn't turn the family in. He sacrifices himself in the hopes that hopefully they'll all live. Spoiler alert, they don't. So I want to leave morality for a minute here, and I want to talk about the evolutionary advantage of taking on a ton of responsibility for your family. Now, obviously, we recognize these as ants, and ants do crazy, crazy things. They turn themselves into bridges. They turn themselves into ropes. They turn themselves into all manners of building material in order to to face the world in order to conquer the environment. It's an amazing thing that these creatures do. Now, I look at these ants and I think, 
look at this guy here who's turned himself into a rope bridge where he's going to stay all day just so the other members of the family can travel from one place to another. And I think, boy, his self-sacrifice there has made the entire family's ability to conquer their environment so much greater, so much more, that I think this has to be a huge evolutionary advantage. Is this not a huge step forward? The idea that one individual can take on the tremendous amount of responsibility that these ants have taken on individually for the good of the larger family, is that not an evolutionary advantage? Is this ant colony not going to far outpace any ant colony that is not willing to do something like this. One ant colony is going to be able to cross whatever body of water it is that they can link their bodies together and get across, and the other ant community that is not going to participate in this behavior is not going to be able to do that, right? One community has a distinct advantage, an evolutionary advantage, a fitness advantage over the other community. Now, I don't claim to know how nature elicits this behavior in ants. I know from a genetic level, ants are all siblings, so they very much could be conceptualized as one organism, that the entire colony is actually a single organism, and each individual is like a cell within that organism. So this is a very interesting way life has developed to to embrace the environment, to conquer the environment. But I look at these ants, I look at this guy here, <laughs> hanging on for dear life, and there's really two ways to conceptualize what's going on here. You can think of this guy as an incredible pain. This is suffering beyond suffering here. Or you could conceptualize this as, this is meaning. This is meaning for him. And just thinking about nature and how nature works, it would seem that something like this would be, at some level, enjoyable for this ant. <laughs> Otherwise, why would he engage in this behavior? How is nature modifying these behaviors of these insects in a way that makes them participate in this kind of activity? I mean, this activity is a huge advantage. And if we simply look at it as a problem nature must solve, nature wants to elicit this behavior because this behavior has an extreme fitness advantage over not listening the behavior, not participating in this behavior. So nature reaches into its bag of tricks and it, it finds a way to elicit this behavior. Now, there is a parallel that can easily be made here to humans. Humans participate in a sort of behavior that has allowed them to conquer the world. And it is not unlike this behavior of self-sacrifice. If we look at Christianity as a kind of narrative technology that gives us a heuristic for behavior, doesn't the Christian story embody the ultimate form of self-sacrifice? Now, I know that you have to think of this in terms of the, the story, the narrative of Christ dying for everyone's mistakes, dying for humanity, dying for the good of the community. But is there a greater sacrifice in that? Does this not just say that we give as much as we can for the greater community and that moves the community forward? Is this not the same idea as sticking together, sacrificing for one another, as we engage the world, as we engage the environment? So just to bring this all together here, I notice that there's always some contentious feelings between the anti-theist community and the religious community, the, the believer community. The atheist, anti-theist community really wants people to know 
that they are good people, that they are moral people, and that they can be moral without a belief in God, without a belief in this narrative story of self-sacrifice for the community. And I think it's a lot to ask. It is a lot to ask because morality isn't about just not killing people. It's not about live and let live. Our society functions because people are willing to go out there and risk their lives for other people's safety. Police officers, the military, these are great sacrifices that these people make to make modern life possible. So it seems logical, rational even, to want to know that your team members are willing to make those sacrifices for you. If we are in a situation where somebody's life is at stake, you are not going to fold under the pressure. So I think if anti-theists have a better understanding of this, this concept of morality as a survival adaptation, maybe they can better understand the intuitions that these religious people have. Because morality is more than just, I'm not going to go around killing people. There is more to being a part of a community, a team, a family, than just not randomly killing people, than not committing murder. There is being good at a bare minimum level, and then there is going out of your way to sacrifice for others. And that's just a huge difference that should be noted. So hopefully this gave you something to think about today. And I'm very curious what you think of this in the comments below. I feel like I'm probably going to get maybe attacked on all sides. I don't know. I don't think religious people always like to conceptualize their faith in this very materialistic way. I think it could be offensive. And I apologize in advance if it is offensive. And I'm also sure that there are non-believers that participate participate in military and police activity that are risking their lives for the greater community that are technically non-believers. They're not affiliated with any faith. So if I have offended you, I apologize in advance as well. I'm just, I'm curious about these ideas and I think it's an interesting way to look at morality. It gives us an idea of why morality exists, why these faiths evolved, the behaviors that these faiths evolved to elicit. And I don't, honestly think that it detracts from the meaning they give our lives. I think it actually better informs the meaning. It gives a rational, scientific basis for that meaning. And ultimately, I think, am I wrong? Is that not what Sam Harris is looking for? To ground morality in scientific truth? Well, first of all, if you don't have a purpose, then, sir, it isn't that your life becomes neutral in a, in a meaningless sense. It's that your life becomes characterized by unbearable suffering. Because the baseline condition of life is something like unbearable suffering.